Welcome. Um, welcome to this final week of this cyber seminar series, Introduction to the Critical Zone Observatories and Watershed Sites. Um, this is the last part of a six part series. Um, my name is Julia Masterman. I'm the Education and Outreach Specialist for QUASI. QUASI is the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science, and our mission is to advance water science by strengthening interdisciplinary collaboration, providing critical infrastructure through our data services, and promoting education in water science at all levels, the programs in part, like this cyber seminar series. QUASI also serves as the National Coordinating Hub for the Critical Zone Collective Network, or CZCN, and we're thankful uh, to the members of the CZ Network team uh, for the contributions to this series. I would encourage you to reach out to me to visit our website, sign up for our newsletter, or jo join our community Slack channel to learn more about QUASI or to get involved, and I'll add information on all those things in the chat in a moment. Um, before we get started, a few logistical things. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the QUASI YouTube channel later this afternoon. Um, if you'd like to watch any of the previous uh, webinars in this series, I'd encourage you to check those out. Those are also on the um, YouTube channel. Um, secondly, please use the Q&A functionality to submit any questions to our um, speakers today. We'll have some time at the end for a Q&A. And finally, we expect that all involved with quasi cyber seminars promote and maintain a professional, considerate, respectful, and collaborative virtual environment. So thank you for being a part of that. Thank you again for joining joining us um, and to the CZN Early Career Network for putting together a fantastic lineup of speakers and presentations over these past uh, six weeks. Um, and we look forward to another series also convened by the CZN Early Career Network beginning October 21st. Um, more information on that will be on the Quasi uh, website um, and posted on our social media and through our newsletters. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, today's session is Connecting Sites and Data, a focus on geomicrobiology. And with that, I'll pass it on to CZN Early Career Network Steering Committee member, um, Bob Narora. Thanks, Julia. You can see the screen and hear me okay? Okay, perfect. So yeah, welcome everyone to the last seminar for this particular series. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Bhavna Arora. I'm a research scientist at Berkeley Lab and uh, very thrilled to be convening this seminar, uh, this webinar series with my early career cohort team and in partnership with the Critical Zone Collaborative Network. So the motivation or the purpose behind this uh, Critical Zone series is really to introduce us mutually to the different critical zone sites and networks. And here, of course, with an acute focus on increasing synthesis and collaboration on geomicrobiological data sets across these watersheds and network sites. In the same vein, uh, we do have an upcoming AGU workshop. Um, and so the seminar series is designed to help us guide the directions and content of that workshop. The workshop itself is called Towards an International Critical Zone Network of Networks for the Next Generation Through Shared Science, Tools, Data, and Philosophy. Um, and, you know, the workshop is really um, aimed at engaging and enhancing an international early career network. And we would be, um, you know, identifying a subset of grand challenge science questions and increasing our cross site and cross network knowledge. Um, so I, I would highly recommend thinking about registering for this workshop. Um, I believe Julia or I will share the link for that. We do have funding for some, um, for early careers to join and register for this workshop. Um, so, so please stay tuned for that. Um, as for today's uh, webinar, the format is we have seven speakers uh, on six minute talks. And um, you, know, you can see the previous webinars in this particular series on the YouTube channel uh, that Julia can share again in the link. And as she announced, we have another cyber seminar series coming up. So right now we're just thinking about what are, where are those data sets available? This next uh, series will target what are the tools available for integrating and synthesizing data from across these um, watershed sites. And um, again, you know, this um, 
series wouldn't have been possible without my early career cohort team or without the leadership that we've received over the years. Um, so with that, I want to pass this on to James to introduce the, speak the panelists for today. Yeah, thanks. I'm really excited to have everybody here. Um, I'm just going to, we're going to run pretty short on time. Um, just got too excited and got lots of speakers. Um, just to quickly say, um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, as you can see in the map here, this is the spatial distribution of uh, where these uh, different speakers are working across the world. And um, I guess I'll just quickly say that you'll be hearing about ecology, evolution, function, and lots of different parts of the critical zone. And I would encourage you all as you're hearing these talks to think about how we can collectively work together to link these kinds of efforts and other efforts that aren't represented today, link them together into a network of networks and to be able to build um, transferable understanding that we can move across um, all parts of their critical zone. And so that's let's kind of end it with that. And um, uh, I think we'll get going then. Uh, hand off to, uh, to Sylvan if you want to sort of launch us. Yeah. Thank you, James. So uh, yeah, the first talk will be by Kayla Boren, who is a postdoc at the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and uh, she couldn't be here today, so uh, she made the recording that we will play now. Hi, my name is Michaela Borden, and I'm a postdoc at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Today, I will be talking to you about the Genome Resolved Open Watersheds Database, or GROWDB for short, which is primarily built around a gene Joint Genome Institute Community Science Program. GROWDB is a community effort to increase genomic sampling and understanding of the global river corridor microbiome with an emphasis on creating a publicly available genome database. Our motivation for GrowDB stems from the paucity of data from world's rivers. So what I'm showing you here is a figure from a recent review of microbiome biogeography studies in M systems that showed that the number of studies focused on inland water bodies like lakes and rivers were seriously lacking compared to soil and ocean studies, despite their important roles in nutrient transport and greenhouse gas production. And so this graph is showing how studies with sequencing have increased over the last 50 years by the black line shown here. And so the other lines are showing how studies of specific microbiomes have increased. So you can see here that inland water bodies are the blue line and have increased relatively slowly, slowly relative to soils and oceans. So what is the GROW database? Over the next two years, we will be generating and analyzing metagenomic or metatranscriptomic sequencing for 250 rivers worldwide, including over 60 sampling sites from eight of the 10 largest rivers in the continental United States, as well as 15 international rivers. Collectively, these samples for the CSP were made as a part of individually funded projects like Wonders and Watersheds Rules of Life and integrated into the GROW database to expand our overall sampling of global rivers. And so these two maps here are showing the coverage of GROW um, of the samples in GROW by project. And so the points are colored by project and the point size indicates the number of samples at a particular site. And so with the community bringing their samples together, we can ask science questions at a larger scale, including globally, is there a core microbiome across rivers? And who are the active microbial members impacting biogeochemical cycles across river corridors? We can also ask what ecosystem features may explain the variation in features of the transient microbiome. And so the first version of the GROW database will be made up of 164 metagenomes, 61 metatranscriptomes, and 69 metabolomes. And so all of those um, data types, um, each of those samples are paired. And so we can also integrate different data types to ask questions um, at that level. And so also from these samples, we have recovered over a thousand mags or metagenome assembled genomes. And so with this data, we can ask genome resolved questions. And so the samples here represent a gradient in river order from small headwater streams to the largest rivers. And that will allow us to interrogate questions focused on the United States specifically. And so, 
GrowDB encompasses multiple PIs from multi multiple institutions, and they are all committed to the mission of open science. And so these include PIs from Colorado State University, Oregon State University, Yale, the Ohio State University, and Pacific Northwest National Lab. And so data from GrowDB will be made publicly available following processing and QC. And so the, overall, this CSP was led by Kelly Wrighton and networks efforts across all of these researchers to move beyond a small collection of well-studied river systems toward a spatially distributed global network of systematic observations that are of appropriate scale and continuity to inform predictive models from local to global scales. GrowDB also synergizes with multiple other institutions, including NMDC, KBase, ESS Dive, and JGI, and aims to build the infrastructure for collecting and integrating multi-omics data. And so if you are interested in collaborating with GloroDB by either utilizing the data or contributing samples to expand global river sampling, please contact us via email. Thanks for your time. Well, thank you, Kayla, for this talk. So um, we will uh, move on. Um, so our next talk is by uh, Vicky Quiroga uh, from the Technolog Technological Institute of uh, Chascomus in Argentina. Um, so Vicky pre-recorded her talk because of maybe of her jumpy connections, but then she will be available for questions in the chat or live later on. Hi. I am Victoria Quiroga. I am going to tell you about. Maybe, hold on a second. I'll try to restart this. Hi, I am Victoria Quiroga. I am going to tell you about the Antarctic specially protected area called Sierra Point. Um, this is a biodiversity hotspot in the Antarctic Peninsula. Since uh, 1997, Dr. Gabriela Mataloni and colleagues have uh, characterized the environmental conditions and microbial communities in different habitats, like freshwater, epiliton, snow, ice, and soil in this system. But our recent approach involves thinking of the mosaic of these different uh, environments as a wetland complex. We are trying to look at the landscape level instead of uh, focusing on the different habitats individually. So with this in mind, um, Gabriela started a project in 2017, which is the framework for this talk. This project aim at laying out the base for an inventory and classification system of Antarctic wetlands and perform a characterization of their structure and biodiversity, taking the Sierra Point's protected area as a study case. So for bacteria communities in particular, we aim at determining if environmental features would impose selection on bacterial assembly or if this will be overridden by the high hydrological connectivity and penguin movements during summer, which would favor high levels of dispersal and impose uh, biotic homogenization. And so also we uh, study the relative influence of these assembly processes at different phylogenetic resolutions. Um, what we did was uh, clustering ASVs into OTUs with different um, sequence identity thresholds, yeah, decreasing sequence identity thresholds. This is the Sierra Point Wetland Complex um, with an area of about one square kilometer. During summer 2018, we took 64 samples and analyzed the bacteria communities with high throughput sequencing of um, the 16S rRNA gene, the B3B4 regions with Illumina MySec. 
we sample eight uh, different wetland types, which for um, simplicity were grouped into lotic, lentic and terrestrial environments. We sample as many wetland types and as many habitat types as possible to encompass the environmental heterogeneity of this uh, system. We apply the new models proposed by James Stegen to study assembly processes. And we uh, found that in this system, the relative influence of the community assembly processes vary with phylogenetic resolution. In particular, selection processes seem to impose a stronger influence at finer, like ASPs, than at coarser resolution. Across all phylogenetic uh, resolutions, we um, observe that pH appears to impose homogeneous selection, and also that um, dispersal appears to be restricted in the environments. Um, as, as you can see from these Google Earth images, um, Sierra Point gets completely covered by snow from April to December. So um, this snow cover landscape could be um, heavily restricting dispersal during most part of the year. Um, so based on, on our results and really briefly, um, we propose that the eco-evolutionary processes lead to a different but very closely related ASBs in lotic, lentic and terrestrial environments. <clears throat> so um, the results that I just show you are from the molecular diversity of prokaryotes team from this um, framework project. Uh, we, the analysis were done in collaboration with Angel Valverde, James Stegen and Don Cohen. But uh, as you can see, there are other um, specialists studying different communities uh, from different institutes and countries. So uh, as future perspectives, um, we are planning an Antarctic campaign for next summer. And um, this time the sampling design will encompass both spatial and temporal scales. And some ideas for uh, collaboration could be sharing data for meta-analysis to ask questions at a global scale instead of just uh, local or regional. And we look uh, forward to hear your ideas for starting new collaborations in uh, Tierra Point. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Um, well, uh, we will stay uh, in the Southern Hemisphere because our next talk is by Oliver uh, Mogasi-Bexwit from uh, the Department of Ge uh, Biochemistry at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Well, Oliver, you're on. Oh, thanks for the intro and thanks for the opportunity to uh, let me give a short talk on this platform. So I guess, um, oops, sorry. So I guess I'm just gonna start off by telling you a bit about, about who, who we are and, and what, what we do here at the University of Pretoria Center for Microbial Ecology and Genomics. So we work on projects that focus on understanding microbial ecology and evolution in, in systems that, that range from human guts to oceans, uh, to soil collected from farms with different farming practices, as well as soils and permafrost from, from Antarctica. So uh, we have just recently started a, a river systems project, uh, which aims at exploring the, the ecology of microbes in the South African uh, river systems. So uh, this particular project uh, composes of multiple uh, sub projects, and then I will talk about just a few of these. Oops. I can transition, sorry about this. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, um, 
so when one of the uh, SASA projects aims at uh, studying the phylogeography and evolution of class phage in rivers that are situated in, in villages or, or areas that, that do not have uh, adequate uh, sanitation. So um, a few months ago, me and my colleague uh, visited, uh, uh, went to visit a village uh, in a neighboring province and collected six water samples from more moderate to highly impacted river sites. Uh, so for these samples, we did coliform counts, and then uh, the counts are shown uh, on the map in yellow. Uh, so it's, it's the map on the left. And then, um, so uh, uh, we, we then proceeded to search for the presence of class phage in, in each of the samples uh, that, that, that we collected. So just for clarity, so uh, for those who don't know, class phage are viruses that are associated with the human guts, and these serve as indicators for, for fecal pollution. So the phylogenetic tree on the right shows how the class phage that we found in, in our sample compared to the six known class phage families uh, that are publicly available. And then uh, the, the, the place that represent uh, known uh, class uh, phage families are colored in gray and those uh, from our samples are, are, are in orange. And you know, just by having a quick look at the tree, uh, one can easily tell that there's at least a distinction be between uh, the phages from, from our data and those that are already characterized yeah, because these do not form any mo mo monophyletic clades. And apart from using these phages as proxies for fecal pollution, uh, we are still uh, for exploring the data to check on the ecological uh, significance of these phages and, and other uh, unrelated viruses, and perhaps also try to look at the functional properties of their potential hosts as well. So uh, the other sub project involves uh, uh, conducting annual water and possibly uh, sediment sample collections uh, to monitor the effects of pollution towards uh, shifts in, in my microbial community structures and function in the South African uh, river systems. So uh, the plan is to start exploring two of the highly polluted rivers in, in our province. And then these are HENOPS, so it is uh, written in green on, on, on the map. And then the other one is Yakske River. So what makes it more interesting to monitor these rivers is that uh, there are dysfunctional uh, wastewater treatment plants uh, see, uh, see situated next to each of these. And, and also, uh, if you look at, at, at the map next to the Yakske uh, River, so there's an informal settlement uh, which is uh, see situated along one of the, of the river banks. And I think uh, it would be interesting to, to look at the effects of domestic waste pollution that, that comes from this particular area, this particular uh, informal settlement. So here um, I'm just showing an example of how, of how parts of the Hanops River look uh, after heavy rain. So the other, the other river, uh, Yaxke, looks like, like this after uh, heavy rain as well. So I guess it, it will make sense uh, to conduct annual monitoring of these rivers and others uh, with, uh, I mean, yeah, so I, I guess mon mon uh, uh, conducting like an, an annual mon monitoring of these rivers and others will help us learn uh, a lot about how pollution and environmental selection shapes the adaptation strategies of microbial communities. And uh, this, this will also include uh, looking at uh, factors uh, that drive uh, resilience and uh, uh, resistance of microbial community structures in, in polluted uh, river systems. And for this particular slide, I know uh, this may sound uh, ambitious, but once we are done exploring all the South African river systems, we plan to expand and continue this, this effort by sampling and monitoring the entire continent. I know it's going to be difficult, but then, uh, so this, uh, with this, we plan to start a, a pan African river systems my microbiome project. And this can only be made possible through a, a collaborative effort. And I guess there, this will help look not only at uh, how pollution influences shifts in microbial diversity and function, but will also help understand how microbes respond to what's shifts in uh, various environmental uh, drivers, as well as the e ecological consequences of these shifts. Thanks. Thank you, Oliver. Cheers. Um, well, um, we'll keep uh, moving on. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Owen Brody, who's a senior scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in, uh, in, in the US. Uh, Owen, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Can you see my slides okay? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share our work at the East River Watershed with you. And uh, I'm uh, excited to uh, chat with you more. 
So we're working uh, as part of the watershed function science focus area at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And that's led by Susan Hubbard, who is on the call here at the moment. And also your colleague, uh, Babna Aurora, leads the water crosscut uh, component of the watershed SFA. But we're focused, on, our research is focused at the Upper Colorado River Basin and the Upper Colorado River Basin snowmelt from this provides um, a significant discharge to the Colorado River, which provides water for approximately one in 10 Americans on the West, in the Western US, a uh, significant contribution to hydroelectric power and also uh, roughly a trillion dollars in economic activity associated with the Colorado River. Um, these mountainous catchments have been experiencing uh, climate perturbation, um, notably changing snowpack dynamics, uh, snow water equivalent as well as snow melt timing. And we're interested in the question of how do these mountainous watersheds retain and release water, nutrients, carbon, and metals, and how does this change along with response to perturbation? And of course, microbiology is a central component of, of this question. Um, we don't just study microbiology, we, we study uh, the, the land form itself, the geology, the vegetation, uh, river chemistry, uh, bedrock chemistry, bedrock properties, um, but integral to all of that is uh, the role and distribution of microbes across the watershed. So we study microbes at the hill slope scale, uh, particularly plant microbe mineral interactions that are involved in nutrient uh, mobilization and nutrient retention. We're also studying riparian zones um, as these nutrients are mobilized from hill slopes into uh, the river systems, how are they retained and released within riparian zones? And we're particularly interested in redox heterogeneity and microbial metabolism in various features of riparian zones. But then also to uh, take what we learn across hill slopes and riparian zones and upscale that information to be, begin to build a sense for uh, are there functional zones within a watershed that will be expected to respond in a similar way to disturbance? And for that, we're looking at microbial trait distributions across watershed functional zones. And I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, we have a big emphasis on nitrogen in a system. Mountainous ecosystems are, tip, are frequently nitrogen limited. So the inputs and exports of nitrogen are, 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 uh, are really important metrics for us. Nick Bauskill on the team leads the nitrogen emphasis. Um, as a, just an example of the types of things that we're measuring here. Uh, we use molecular diagnostics of pathway importance, so that could be uh, gene presence, gene uh, enrichment, gene expression, et cetera, but also isotope uh, fractionation as estimation of relative contributions of different nitrogen cycling pathways to this flux of nitrogen. Of course, nitrogen is not independent. The nitrogen cycle, it interacts with other elements. And a key goal is to explore nitrogen and interacting elemental cycles, particularly as they interact with weathering processes and uh, collaborators on, on this team or members of the team, uh, Lucien Stoltz and Bavna, Bavna, who you know, are working on with Ben Gilbert mechanisms of shale weathering and building reactive transport mod models for this. Again, we're looking then at microbial uh, uh, trait distributions across the watershed. So we've performed uh, large metagenomic surveys and built computational tools uh, to be able to distill microbial genomes into traits across the watershed. I'll give you, give you a couple of quick vignettes. Uh, one of the first one is that we, we know snow pack properties influence microbial retention and loss from hill slopes. Uh, here we've seen that microbial biomass blooms underneath the winter snow pack as snow melt begins and starts to infiltrate. But then we see a large crash of microbial biomass and a pulse um, of mobile nitrogen. And that's driven by uh, a bloom and a increase in expression, huge increase in expression of archaeal nitrifiers. Uh, when we have a shallower snowpack, we don't see this. So snowpack is driving nutrient release through microbes in that case. Uh, we also see that below the, the uh, unsaturated zone, in the saturated zone, and in the variably saturated zone, that shale bedrock that underlies much of the watershed is weathering and is releasing a, a, a significant fraction of the nitrogen budget for this ecosystem, at least at this hill slope site. And we're bi building um, new mechanistic understanding of these processes uh, of weathering and also building reactive transport models at these scales uh, to try and address this. Um, moving into the river flood, floodplain meanders, we see that these are key to retention and loss. And one of the key questions is, are meanders replicatable units? Could we use those to scale biological processes? And work from Jill Banfield's group with uh, Paola Mateus Carnavali has shown that across these meanders over multiple kilometers, that about a third of genomes are shared across this meanders, and that's pretty astonishing. It, it suggests very strong selective pressure. 
and that may be a lack of dispersal limitation in that case. Um, and when you look at the expression of this, we can see that nitrification and dissimilar nitrate reduction are high, very highly expressed. And the interplay between these is likely very important to nitrogen retention in a nitrogen limited system. And, and finally, I just want to tell you a little bit about our approach to scaling microbial traits via remote sensing. Uh, we've been performing multiple microbial metagenomic uh, surveys, targeted surveys across the watershed, work from Alex Thomas, Pat Sorensen, Paola Mateus Carnavalli, and Adi Lavi, and taking that information along with uh, watershed scale imaging, so hyperspectral, geophysics, uh, vegetation ground surveys, soil data ground surveys, all of these data layers using machine learning to start to build a picture of how uh, the variance of these components interacts and correlates across the watershed scale. That work's being led by Haruko Wainwright, that's in, in review at the moment. And this uh, co coordinated uh, airborne uh, geophysics and ground-based campaign across the whole watershed was, was coordinated by Dana Chadwick, and that's published in Ethics, Ecology and Evolution. Now what we're doing is distilling the genomes from across all of these efforts into traits and looking at microbial trait distributions and the factors that distribute those across the watersheds. And Haruko has been working on this concept, concept of watershed functional zones. So here seen as these colors, we might expect these different zones because of their combination of properties to respond in a similar way to disturbance and contribute in the same way to river water discharge. And so that work is ongoing, looking at how these watershed functional zones relate to concentration, chemical concentration discharge relationships, plus isotope systematics of nitrogen species. And all of this is then being embedded in large scale, uh, multi-scale high performance computing modeling efforts. Um, I just want to finish by saying that uh, although this is a project that's run out of uh, Berkeley Lab, uh, it's really enabled by the, the a community of researchers that have coalesced around this site and Ken Williams is leading the community efforts to bring people together. To date, this effort has supported about 500 scientists and over 100 students and postdocs. And uh, we're excited to welcome any students, faculty, postdocs to come and collaborate with us at the watershed. And we're also excited to be part of this broader network. And I'll finish by saying that the data from this is also open and available through ESS Dive and NDC, and our tools are becoming available on, on KBase as well. So thank you for, for uh, listening and happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you, Owen. Um, well, uh, we'll keep track of time and we keep moving. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Susanne Liebner, uh, who's a professor at the German Research Center for Geoscience in Potsdam. Uh, Susanne pre-recorded her talk, so uh, we will play it now and hopefully she will be back for a question later on. Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Susanne Liebner from the GFZ, the German Research Center for Geosciences. And I would like to give you a brief introduction into the micro. Biology of the Torino Observatory. Torino stands for Terrestrial Environmental Observatories. And the overall goal of those observatories is to investigate the impact of global change on regional water and material cycles. There are four of those Torino um, observatories in Germany, uh, which span a gradient from near natural landscapes um, via agricultural land towards urban landscapes. Um, and all those observatories are meant to run for at least 15 years. They are part of the Helmholtz uh, Association and the uh, GFZ, which is a Helmholtz center, runs the um, Terreno Northeast Observatory, which is located in the northeastern lowlands um, of Germany. The operation of Terreno Northeast as a critical zone observatory does not only include um, actual monitoring, so real-time measurements, but it also includes the utilization of proxies from, uh, for example, uh, tree rings or lake sediments in order to look into the long-term climate and landscape changes. So a speciality of, um, of this observatory, I think, is the combination of recent monitoring um, with a long time series in order to dissect long-term trends and variabilities in lake, for example, lake level fluctuations or climate variability. 
Now our microbial uh, work um, is part of two work packages of Torino Northeast. Um, on one hand, we uh, contribute to the work package on carbon um, fluxes or the carbon budget, but we also work on sedimentary DNA as part of this um, work package looking into long-term climate and landscape changes. A central topic of the Reno Northeast is the monitoring of greenhouse gas fluxes from degraded and rewetted fans. The background is that um, more than two thirds of the total wetland area has been lost in Europe in the past hundred years um, due to drainage and uh, those drained wetlands are um, a substantial source of CO2 uh, globally, but also in Germany. Therefore, large rewetting projects have been initiated with the aim to restore the carbon sink functionality of these um, um, wetlands. So as part of Torino, we are monitoring two rewetted fans, um, which uh, have been observed to be large sources of methane, but also even of CO2, um, even many years after uh, rewetting. Now, what we want to understand is uh, in how far the microorganisms are responsible for the observed high fluxes of methane, um, but also of CO2. So on an annual basis, um, but sometimes also on a seasonal uh, basis, we do field campaigns um, and do peat sampling in these two um, wetlands, which is the Hüttelmoor um, here close to the um, Baltic Sea and um, the Pol Zanaku, more inland. Um, and uh, it, in addition to this sampling, we record um, oxygen concentrations using planar optodes, so an optical way to measure oxygen concentrations. And we also analyze a bunch of um, lab parameters such as microbial taxonomic and functional diversity um, population sizes of microorganisms uh, driving the methane cycle, rates of methane in CO2 production and methane oxidation, um, isotopes, but also a bunch of soy bulk and pore water geochemical analyses. One outcome uh, of our work uh, was that the ratio between those microorganisms that produce methane and those that consume methane um, in these environments is very different to what we know from natural wetlands in a way that the community of methane consumers is only very poorly um, established after rewetting um, and even many years after rewetting. Um, however, this uh, substantially changes or changed after a severe drought in 2018, um, where we saw that not only the methane fluxes were substantially uh, lower relative to the previous years, but we also found that the group of methane oxidizers after the drought has substantially increased. Now, drought events will um, become more frequent, uh, especially in the northeastern part of Germany. So this may be um, a stimulation for, um, uh, for the microbial communities um, triggering the greenhouse gas fluxes from degraded fence, uh, also on the longer term. With this last slide, I want to mention that we also work on subsurface genomics um, as part of this observatory. And specifically, we use sedimentary DNA as a record for past biodiversity. Um, what we do is that uh, what we want to figure out is how the um, community composition and diversity of the group of cyanobacteria has changed uh, throughout the Holocene um, and uh, along the transition into the Anthropocene. Um, this is because um, cyanobacteria are very sensitive towards temperature increases and eutrophication. Um, and also they are an ideal group to study in, um, in old and deep sediments because cyanobacteria are oxygenic um, phototrophs. So we can be quite certain that in the, um, uh, uh, among the total gene pool that we find in, um, in the subsurface, um, those genes that belong or the DNA that belongs to cyanobacteria 
um, is from fossil or so-called uh, dead um, cells. While um, otherwise, of course, there's a lot of bacteria in the subsurface that is currently active and could not be easily used as a proxy for, for, um, for the past. And with this, um, I already I want to close this uh, presentation in acknowledging the Torino Northeast um, network, of course, and all our partners. But specifically, I would like to acknowledge those people that, um, or the mainly students that have been producing and analyzing all the microbial data. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Um, well, our next speaker is uh, Emma Aronson, uh, who is an associate professor at the University of California in Riverside. Um, hello, Emma. Um, uh, if you're ready to share your screen, and uh, then uh, whenever you want to start, the floor is yours. Okay, give me just a second to finish setting up. Uh, can you see this correctly on your screens? Yes, perfect. Wonderful. Okay, I'm very happy to uh, be a part of this session today. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I am uh, leading a uh, relatively recently funded critical zone network project, which is funded by the US NSF. Um, there's 10 such projects, uh, but I am leading the one that's focused on uh, geomicrobiology uh, and biogeochemistry. We call it CZNet Geomicro. Um, and the main goals of our particular cluster that was funded um, is to really develop a predictive understanding of the role of geomicrobiology as a driver of the biogeochemistry in the critical zone. Um, so we focused a lot on building on former critical zone observatories. So this is the map of all the former critical zone observatories. And I've uh, circled the five where we are now um, building uh, long-term infrastructure to uh, follow um, the microbial communities uh, and their activities um, using sensors uh, at depth uh, across all these five sites. Um, so the big questions are, we wanna understand how uh, deep does the influence of the surface uh, go in influencing the soil microbial community and how shallow, how high up in the soil surface do we see the impacts of differences in things like bedrock or soil formation processes. Um, and then really, we, we keep wanting to understand, and I think this is a much larger question that many people think about, um, how different microbial communities are across soil, the soil surface from place to place versus um, with depth from the surface. Uh, we're thinking of that as a continental scale, but um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in the possibilities to think about such questions across a global scale. Uh, through collaborations with those here today. I'm very excited by some of the work that everybody's doing. Um, so this effort is building on a previous effort from a few years ago, um, while the Critical Zone Observatory Network was still uh, fully functioning, where uh, I collaborated with a group of researchers, someone, at least one person, usually multiple people from each and every one of the 10 uh, critical zone observatories, where we sampled down to one meter. Our new product is going deeper than that in our sampling and our instrumentation, um, but down to one meter um, or refusal if it was more shallow than that. Uh, and we got um, samples for many different analyses and had a lot of different collaborators doing many different analyses on those samples. I'm just giving a tiny snip snippet of that data um, right now to give you a sense of why we chose the sites for this new project that we did. Um, we did amplicon sequencing. I'm focusing on the 16S RNA V3 and V4, I'm sorry, uh, V4, V5 genes um, for uh, bacteria and archaea. And um, we, oh, there we go. Uh, we found overall, of course, as expected, um, bacteria differed by, by site and also by depth. And so um, I'm sort of grouping uh, the different depths at each site in one of these polygons. Um, and uh, more interesting than that, though, we found a shift uh, or a schism between sites where some sites showed uh, very similar diversity with depth, uh, which was completely unexpected. We expected all the sites to show something more similar to the red line you're seeing here, where there's de decreases in diversity with depth. And that's not what we observed at um, a, a number of sites. We also saw that the um, microbial communities, uh, the composition um, at depth in sites that now I'm gonna start calling 
um, gradient sites that are more different with depth really had a wide variety of, of community compositions, um, whereas there was a much tighter grouping uh, among the shallow soils and the um, deeper soils of what I'll now call uh, uniform sites, sites that um, stayed very similar with depth. So um, I'm contrasting here, these are the five former CZOs where our project is taking place. Um, we've got uh, one in Arizona, Idaho, um, California, Puerto Rico, and South Carolina. So a wide array of different locations really chosen because about half of the locations are relatively uniform with depth, which is again, uh, diversity with depth that you're seeing here, relatively uh, straight across. Um, versus uh, a lot of differences with depth uh, uh, of the microbial community. Um, and that's what you would see with these um, sites on the right. So this is the uniform on the left and the gradient sites on the right. So we are trying to understand what are the drivers? Why are some uh, locations showing such similarities in microbial communities with depth? Will that be borne out when we go deeper? We're gonna go down to 2.5 meters in these um, uh, uh, current uh, locations. Um, when that's possible, there's some shallow uh, soil pits. Um, and and what, what's driving these trends? Why do we see such um, similarities? We think that um, at the uniform sites, for whatever reason, that uh, things like bedrock lithology, soil type, mineralogy, hydrology, um, and groundwater are not as important as drivers of the microbial community. Um, and that might be one of the reasons that we are not seeing such differences with depth. So the new plans, um, we're instrumenting uh, with gas sensors to monitor uh, CO2, O2, and then um, you know soil moisture and temperature. Um, but we are also putting in gas wells to be able to look at changes in the, um, the carbon-13 and carbon-14 with depth and other uh, uh, gas um, uh, uh, shifts in isotopic composition. Um, the pits we're, we're instrumenting um, are at uh, a ridge, a mid-slope and or a toe slope. So two or three uh, instrumented pits per site, just varying because there's such differences between our sites. So we have to be adaptive. Um, and uh, they're uh, on Katina's and two contrasting sites uh, within each of these former CZOs. So we're really hoping to capture a lot of uh, the variability that we observed in this first you know, big, what we call a cross CZO endeavor in the new CZNet GeoMicro. So um, because these microbial communities uh, differed in their um, changes with depth uh, at each site, we're really trying to understand um, better by doing more environmental analyses, uh, doing repeated sampling across time. Are these uh, uh, trends stable temporally, um, as well as uh, across different locations uh, across the, the Katina within each site? Um, so we are very interested, interested also in working with others on metagenomics and other uh, types of analyses across sites. So if there's ideas for collaboration between those um, who have presented here today, uh, I'm very open to and interested in discussing further, um, just acknowledging this is mostly funded by uh, NSF um, and EarthCube uh, of NSF funded uh, some of that initial analysis. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I hope there's a chance for some questions at the end. Thank you, Emma. Um, well, um, we come to our last speaker of today. Uh, Tanguy Le Borgne is a professor at the University of Rennes uh, in France. And uh, Tanguy, if you want to, yeah, share your screen. And uh, whenever you're ready. Hello. Um, so let me see that work. Yeah, you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, thanks for the invitation. So it's a, a pleasure to participate to this discussion. I, I, I'm a hydrogeologist uh, and have been, I've been collaborating um, over the last years with uh, microbiologists to try to understand uh, the links between um, flow, uh, chemical gradients, uh, reactions and, and uh, microbial uh, activity in the critical zone. And so I'm going to show a um, brief, very briefly, uh, uh, recent, uh, some of the recent uh, results that we had in a specific site uh, that belongs to the Oscar Critical Zone Observatory in France. And so that, that's uh, here, uh, the question is to investigate the deep, uh, deep subsurface and how um, microbial communities uh, develop in, in, at, at these depths. 
um, knowing that they, it, it's thought to be a, a significant, to, to, to represent a significant part of the biomass on Earth, but it's uh, quite uncertain. And, and so focusing on a particular uh, type of bacteria, iron oxidizing bacteria, you see here an, an image uh, that use um, iron and oxygen to, uh, for their metabolism. And, and, and in, in this um, uh, process, they, they build this kind of uh, interesting uh, structure, biomineral structure. Uh, and so um, the, this site here is part of the H plus uh, um, network of hydrogeological observatories, just to give you a, a, a bit of uh, how this is organized in France. And this, this uh, that studies the hydro, so the deeper part of the critical zone. And this is part of a network of, uh, of critical zone observatories in France, we, which link uh, the, all the different compartments. And at larger scale, uh, this is part of the, this is going to be part of the ELTER uh, European uh, network, uh, where the Terreno uh, sites are also, that we have heard of before, are also uh, included. Uh, and so the, the site here that I, I'm, I'm presenting now is uh, located in Brittany, in this west part of, uh, of uh, France. And so it's a fractured rock site with um, with uh, mostly granite, granite and mica schist, so hard rock, and uh, significant flow occurring in uh, fracture networks. And so the starting point of this uh, particular study um, is was the observation of a, of a, a, a biofilm um, development, a huge biofilm development here that you see in this borehole. This is a, a, about a 16 centimeter diameter. And we observe this uh, development of uh, orange biofilm, which is uh, composed uh, of um, a, a, a large portion of iron oxidizing bacteria. And as you go down, so this is now uh, about 47 meter, uh, we, we still see some biofilm and, and that develop preferentially uh, around fractures. So in that case, we see, uh, you see here in this, in this uh, uh, here at 80, about 80 meter. Uh, so uh, there is here a clear link between uh, fracture flow and uh, microbial uh, activity. And so these uh, iron oxidizing bacteria uh, use, uh, they need uh, both uh, uh, iron and oxygen for their, uh, to create uh, uh, iron oxidation and use this for their metabolism. So our hypothesis here was that uh, Iron was provided by deep groundwater and oxygen by shallow groundwater. And we verified this uh, in the field by measuring oxygen. So here you see a, a view from um, a, in a plant view from, from above of, of the different boreholes. And here a cross section uh, that represents our conceptual model where um, uh, we have on this site a deep uh, groundwater that, that uh, uh, flows along fractures that uh, mixes with uh, recently recharged uh, uh, surface water that uh, is oxygen rich. And so this creates uh, this kind of hotspots of uh, iron oxidizing bacteria, which can develop uh, quite deep at these intersections. And so we, we, we measured very deep, uh, in a detailed, uh, in the borehole, uh, concentration of, of oxygen and the, in this place where the biofilm was observed we we actually have, have uh, measured one oxic fracture that is in blue here in a network of anoxic fractures but measuring oxygen at different time we saw that the, actually the oxygen concentration showed here as a function of depth for two different date, dates is quite intermittent in time and and so there is an intermittent delivery of oxygen at depths here uh, you see a result of a metagenomic analysis that uh, shows that uh, the iron oxidizing bacteria, which are uh, all these um, uh, bacteria here, uh, increase a lot in the fracture where you have intersection between the oxic and anoxic uh, fractures. So using this, we, we have developed um, a mathematical model linking hydrology, reactive transport, and microbial habitat for this particular type of bacteria. Uh, that allows us to predict, okay, at, at which depths we may uh, observe this, this, this process uh, as a function of the hydraulic properties of the fractures here, transmissivity, and how these uh, depths of uh, microbial oxidation with these processes may vary in time 
because of this intermittent ox uh, delivery of oxygen. So, so this is uh, um, here uh, an example of a particular type of microorganism. It's quite important because it's uh, thought to be a primary producer of uh, organic matter in the deep surface. So it could uh, quite, uh, uh, so its, its, its activity could, it, could be uh, control uh, the, the development of other microbial communities. So um, uh, this is an, an example um, here I, I choose to focus on uh, for this presentation, but of course uh, in, within the network, uh, there are many more uh, geomicrobiology studies. Uh, and, and so um, uh, we, we would be very happy to, to discuss and collaborate on this general topic with uh, the other uh, uh, participants. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much to, to all the speakers. That was awesome. Um, and so I, I gave uh, in the chat on the side, I gave the speakers a, a question, which was basically, we only have a couple of minutes here. So we've seen a ton of different environments, really interested in your collective perspectives on what is the keystone move we can make to build a network of networks focused on geomicrobiology, given that we're talking about hot places, cold places, wet places, dry, above ground, below ground, so diverse. How can we move towards a network of networks? Maybe if you each go like 10 seconds, give us your like your number one. Oliver, you're in my upper left. So do you have a thought on that? Yeah, so based on your questions, I think maybe we can try to search for things like uh, international funding, calls for international funding, or even bilateral calls. And then I, I guess in order for us to be able to do that, then we'll have to find common ground on see similar questions. And then from our side, we lack on geomicrobiology, on the microbiolo uh, geomicrobiology aspect. So I guess it would be interesting to collaborate with all of you to have that in our, in our group as well. Cool, thank you. Uh, Victoria, do you have a thought to add? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, a common question based on some theory, some um, theoretical framework, right? Um, that that we all have the data to uh, put in common uh, to answer that question, not in the local or regional, but in the global scale. Yeah, cool. Thank you, uh, Susanna. You wanna say a quick word? Yeah, I mean, we have seen a lot of different questions, I think, and approaches. So I guess we I agree with Oliver, we need common ground. And I think talking about critical zones would actually be good in finding out where do microbes lead and where do they lag? So where do they really, where are they really decisive for processes and tipping point, for example, and where do they just follow the environment? Emma, do you want to follow up on that? Seems kind of aligned with your work. Yeah, I really liked that, Suzanne. Um, the idea of, of where do microbes lead and where do they follow? I, I feel like that's the kind of question that a lot of what we're already uh, planning to do across the sites in the US um, would lead us to be able to work towards the answers to a question like that. Um, you know, once we get into uh, hopefully the metatranscript omics, which is uh, about a year or two off, but definitely um, through looking at the sensor data and the microbial community data, I think we could start to um, approach a question like that. So yeah, I think we need to organize around a, a common question or set of questions to be able to, to do it. Even if there's difference in methods, um, many of us are using omics technique, techniques. And so there's some commonalities that we could build on already. Cool. Owen and then Tangi. Uh, yeah, I'd say that the first thing is open data. I think there's a, a wide range of questions that we have this for. So open data, so we can each collaborate uh, on questions that are of interest to us. I think the topic of um, evolution in the context of assembly and at the same time scales, I think it's something that there's a great opportunity to look across sites at and identify relative rates of evolution and how those differ according to uh, landscape features and perturbation, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, you wanna get the last words and then Bob um, will close this. Yeah. I think, well, this kind of uh, discussion is certainly a first step to, uh, to know each other. and. And uh, perhaps it would be useful to, uh, to to create a series of this kind of uh, of seminars and, and 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 use this to identify questions that are common to different sites. I also agree that the uh, database is an important aspect, and uh, 
trying to link the different database and use common formats uh, would be certainly very useful. Thank you, Bhavna, did you wanna close real quick? I know we're over. Yeah, sure. Wow, that, that was a super exciting webinar to close the series, actually. You know, I, I saw a lot of diversity and, you know, unique settings and unique approaches that you've all used and sets up very nicely for the next webinar that's planned, which is on tools. How do we go from all of these open, hopefully open data sets to uh, tools for integrating and synthesizing these. So thank you so much for the panelists for today and to all the attendees. Um, let's close out. Thank you. Thanks everybody. It's awesome. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.